So before we get back to the module arithmetic, which we're doing Z, I think Z6, we're going to look back at the <coughs> turning that linear system into a linear combination. So our original linear system is written out here, and I want to rewrite it as a linear combination of vectors. So it turns out there's actually going to be a combination of seven vectors. And it's probably easiest to see in the matrix over here. So all I did was every column of the matrix I turned into a column vector. And then let's see if I can get all this on the board. There we go. The first column was the x1 column, the second was x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7, and then constants. And you can see down below we have the x1 vector, the column vector, plus the x2 times the column vector, plus x3 times the column vector, etc. So it's very formulaic how to turn a linear system into a linear combination. All you have to do is basically each column becomes a column vector and then whatever your coefficient or your variable is, that goes in front of the column like this. So this, unfortunately I can't put both on the same board at the same time, but this linear combination of vectors is the exact same thing that we are looking at originally here with our linear system. So they represent the exact same relationship in two different forms. So it's a little bit weird, but our your dimensions get kind of transposed. It looks like you have a seven-dimension seven system, but what you really have is seven uh, variables. And uh, you can see you can do it in four dimensions. You don't have to be in seven dimensions. Now there are implications. If we look back at the vector combination here, linear combination of vectors, what vectors would be the easiest to use? What vectors are nice on the left? There's four vectors that are way nicer than the other three. So one, two, five, and six. Now if you look at the way those are lined up, those are basis vectors. So I can make any four dimensional vector using those four vectors. I don't have to use the other three. So what that means is there's basically three vectors that are free. I can choose whatever I want for three vectors and then make up for it with these four vectors. So that's another way to think about free uh, variables, that there's more vectors than we need for the dimension that we're working in. So we're really working in four dimensions here, but I had seven vectors. I really only need four of them. So that's another way to think about free variables. So we'll get more into uh, looking at this. This will be uh, looking at like rank, column space, and row space. So we'll look, break this down a little bit more later. Let's finish our multiplication table for Z6. So I'll do the, uh-oh, I already messed up. What is wrong with this table? On the left side, you start at one. So I'm missing a zero. So we'll just go and re-number. Actually, I'll go, I'll just squeeze a zero, one and two. All right, I'll do the first row. 
0 times every number is 0. The second row should be as easy. Third row gets a little more tricky. So I want you to figure out what all the other rows are. I'll do row 3 so you can check. So I just filled in row 3. And remember, you can only use the digits 0 through 5. You should, I should see no 6s, 7s, 8s, nothing bigger than 5, and no negatives. The pattern will be a little funky. Questions. You should see a lot of zeros, more, maybe more than you had expected. You are counting up each row. It could be considered just multiples, basically. That's all you're doing, but the multiples get weird as they wrap around and kind of go from you know, 6 is 0. So it's a little strange. Let's look at row 1 and row 4. Five. What do you notice about row one and row five the other rows don't have? Fives. They got fives. What else do they have? Or what's not missing from either row? They have all the numbers. So that means if I think of the number 1, I can multiply 1 by something to make every other number in the system. That shouldn't be surprising for 1. But if we look, I can multiply a number times 5 and get any number I want to. So what that means is 1 and 5 are the only numbers that have inverses in this system. Meaning they're the only numbers who I can multiply by and get to 1. <clears throat> Not only that, all the other rows, they don't have any ones in them. Mm -hmm. So multiplicatively, there's numbers that don't have inverses or reciprocals, is how we would normally think of that. Uh, 
We're, that would be more of a concern in a algebra, uh, al abstract algebra and number theory class, but I just want to point stuff like that out. You can multiply numbers and get zero now. And some numbers, for example, what is the inverse, multiplicative inverse of five? Five times what equals one? Five times five equals one, which means five is equal to the reciprocal, multiplicative inverse which is really strange. I mean, one obviously is equal to one reciprocal. That's not surprising. We knew that before. But in this system, five is its own inverse, because five squared is one. So we're not going to worry about those properties. That's, again, different class. We'd worry about that. What we're going to do is now look at vectors whose elements come from <coughs> Z3. And then we're going to do vector operations on uh, over this uh, Z3 field. So if I want to write the vector, the two-dimensional vector in Z3, this is how I'm going to write it. And recall, if I want a two-dimensional real vector, I would do R2. So all I'm doing is taking out R and replacing it by Z3. So I'm just making a swap here. So this is going to be two-dimensional vectors whose elements come from Z3. So that was two real dimension vectors. Now we have two vectors in um, Z3. And I'll have U, the vector U, be the 2, 1 vector. V is going to be 0, 2. And now I want to find 5U minus 3V. Well, let's do plus first. I haven't shown you what minus is in this weird system. Can you still, you did five, but we're in Z3. Ah. scalars change? I was thinking I was in Z6 for a second. So let's do 2U plus V. I'll just do that. 2U plus V. So we got 2 times 2, 1 plus zero two. Now first thing I'm going to do is scalar multiplication so we're going to distribute that two into the first vector. So you can write four two if you really want to but remember four is not really four. What is four in our Z3 system? Four is really one. So two times two is one plus 0, 2, and then we do this addition. We have 1 plus 0, 2 plus 2. 1 plus 0 is 1, 2 plus 2 is also 1. So our vector is 1, 1. So any question on that? So we'll do another example. Let's let u equal. Well, let's let's move up to z6. It's more fun. So we'll take the vector u to be uh, two three, and then v will be two five. No, you just say number twice. Let's go. Four five. So we'll find three u minus two v. All right, I haven't shown you how to subtract. So what we're going to do instead. Well, first of all, I have told you there is no subtraction. So 
we're really adding negative 2 V let's turn negative 2 into a positive value I think we did that before but the way we can do it we're in Z6 so what I'm gonna do so turn negative 2 into positive what can I add to negative 2 and not change it? Zero, also known as, in this case, 6. So I'm going to add a 6 to it, which means I'm adding 0 to it. So minus 2 plus 0 is minus 2 plus 6, which is 4. So we're really looking at 3u plus for v because negative 2 is positive 4. So we got rid of the negatives. Now we can compute this. You could compute this by hand or you could use a multiplication chart. Probably better to just recompute it by hand rather than look up at your chart get a little more practice. So same thing as before, do your scalar multiplication in one step and then do your addition in the second step. So any questions on this arithmetic here? So I'll put a few uh, homework problems up that are going to be over Z. Well, they won't all be Z3 or Z6, but they'll be over Z something, a reasonable number. I won't do like Z7000. Well, if the number gets big, it actually gets kind of easy if you deal with small numbers because they act the same. Except negatives, they get messed up immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, but I won't put... This is all called modular arithmetic. I won't put um, modular arithmetic, well, maybe I'll put it on your quiz or midterm, but I'll put it in an easier problem. It wouldn't be in a like row reduction situation where you're doing serious row operations and uh, <laughs> trying to keep those straight while doing modular arithmetic simultaneously. So if I do put it on, uh, it'll be a more, uh, where the algebra is a lot easier. So we're gonna look add some more linear combinations um, and this is going to get into spanning sets and linear independence so we'll jump into the next section so in my notes here I have them as the same section so we might be I think we'll be doing the next three sets simultaneously well obviously linear independence and dependence are the same thing well, not the same thing, but they're exactly the opposites of each other. Uh, so we'll just be doing all these at the same time. So we're going to go back and keep it real with real numbers. So I will make sure that I tell you if we're not working with real numbers. So if you just see one, two, three, you don't necessarily know if, you, if those are real or modular uh, integers. But if I don't 
tell you we're using Z3 or Z6 or Z something else, we're going to usually be in real numbers. So is this vector 1, 2, 3 a linear combo of 1, 0, 3 and negative 1, 1, negative 3. So to answer this question, let's just try it out. So what would a linear combination of these two vectors look like? So it'll be x1, I could use alphas, I'll just write alpha1 v1 plus alpha2 v2 equals some vector that's not changing. And I'm just going to fill in the vectors we have up here. So alpha 1, 1, 0, 3, plus alpha 2, uh, negative 1, 1, negative 3, equals 1, 2, 3. So what are some ways to figure out, uh, well first of all, before we even try to figure things out, either using a uh, vector algebra or putting this into a matrix, how many variables do we have? Two. two. How many dimensions are we in? Three. three. So just knowing those two pieces of information, there's a chance this won't work out. Uh, if I had three, if I had another vector and another uh, multiplied by another scalar, I would have a higher chance of this actually being possible. But we're a little low on vectors and high on dimensions. So we don't have as many vectors as we have dimensions. So there's already a decent chance it may not work out. So there's a few ways to do this. Let's write out the three linear equations we would get. Just regular algebra linear equations we get. I'll write out the first one. It'll be alpha one minus alpha two equals one. So that's the first linear equation, write out the other two, then put this into a matrix and try to figure out alpha one and alpha two. So these, the matrix is small, so there's not many row operations to get to the row reduced echelon form. And I have three, two as my alpha one, alpha two. So any uh, questions on that? So let's check and see. When we check, we're gonna use the original vector equation, not the linear system we wrote down. Because I may have made a mistake writing the linear system down, so we'll check on the vector equation. This one does work out to one, two, three.
So what is the answer to the question? Yes. yes, it is. So we can definitively say yes, because we have shown that there is a precise uh, set of scalars, three and two, that give us that combination. So we know the exact combination to make that vector. <coughs> so we're gonna look at a very similar question. So is beta times one, two, three, a linear combo of the same two vectors, one, oh, three, and negative one, one, negative three. So I'm gonna write the same uh, setup that we had before. So what is the only difference between this linear combination equation and the one at the very top of the board on the left? There's an extra constant, extra scalar beta on the right side. So certainly when beta equals one, we know for sure we got it. Uh, but what would happen if beta was two? How do you think that would change alpha one and alpha two? Double it. We just need something twice as big. So beta was three, alpha one and two would just be three times their regular size. So we know, I'm gonna fill in the alpha one, alpha two values we just got. We know that three times 103. Actually, let's be lazy and write even less. That's too much writing. We don't need all this stuff. We'll do alpha one, V one, alpha two, V two equals B. I think I called it beta B, yeah. So we have V one's that first vector, V two is that second vector, and then B is the one, two, three vector. I know that three V one plus two V two equals B. So what do I do on the left side of this equation for this to actually be true? It's not true the way it's written right now. So I have to multiply by beta. So I'm just multiplying both sides by a scalar. And we saw before, scalar uh, distribute across addition. So that was one of the algebraic properties of scalar multiplication across addition. You can just distribute right across. So we have three beta V1 plus two beta V2 equals beta B. So we could get a linear combination of any scalar multiple of anything in there. All you have to do is scale your combination. And then you're gonna get any multiple of a vector in there. So it's time for definition of span. So span takes multiple vectors so it's going to be all linear combinations of these vectors. If we write it in set notation, it's like alpha one V one plus alpha two V two plus dot 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 alpha N V N. 
Now, the vectors v1 through vn already existed, but alpha is something I just started writing here. So I have to write alpha 1, comma, alpha 2, comma, dot, 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 alpha n come from the real numbers, meaning they are scalars. So that's the span. It's just every linear combination of those vectors. Now, graphically, what does that mean? Let's look at the easiest case, which is span of uh, one vector. Well, you could have a span of zero vectors, uh, but that's kind of trivial because there's no vectors, there's nothing to do. So I believe that would be the empty set. What we're going to do instead is look at the span of one vector. So we'll do this in two dimensions so that uh, I can draw a nice picture. Let's take the vector 1, 2. So I can certainly graph that vector, go over 1, go up 2. So it'll look like this right here. That's the vector 1, 2. Now, the span is every multiple, every scalar multiple of this vector. There's no other vectors to add to it, so it's just scale this single vector right here. So if I make the vector longer, multiply it by a large, large positive number, I will get everything, I'll switch to green. I will have everything up here. And if I multiply it by negative scalars, I'll have everything in the other direction right there. So the span of one vector is a line going through the origin. So that's a span of a single vector. So a span of one vector is a line through the origin. We've seen a line through the origin come up before. Where did that come up in this class? There's a solution. So it was the null space when there was one free variable. So uh, generally you can have a line, but it only goes through the origin if it's a solution to a homogeneous linear system. Uh, if it's not homogeneous, you'll have a, you could have a line, but it won't go through the origin. Homogeneous means it's going to go through the origin. Uh, so this is going to be related to the null space of a certain uh, matrix. Let's look at the span of two vectors. So if I stick to two dimensions, it's going to be a little bit lame because our span will be covering, well, it depends on what two vectors I pick, actually. So let's do, let's do span of the 1, 2 vector and the uh, 2, 1 vector. So quickly sketch those two out and then think about all linear combinations of those two vectors and what points you could hit on the plane. And are there any points you could not hit? So what I'm doing with the green marker is drawing a grid or graph paper that's parallel with the original uh, vectors right here. I'm basically redoing my axes. So I have my first axis is along the 1, 2 direction. And my second axis is in the 2, 1 direction. Now when you see it laid out like this, no matter what point I pick, even if it's not on an intersection here, 
no matter what point I pick, I will be able to travel some distance along the first uh, axis or the first vector and then some distance along the second axis or second vector and hit that point. So this particular purple point right here, let's see, I'll go, so these two purple vectors right here, which are hard to see. So if I use these two purple vectors, go down left a little bit and then up right. And I'll be able to hit that uh, point right there. I could do the same thing no matter what, uh, no matter where this purple point is, I could figure out how much to go on the first uh, axis and the second axis to get there. So what that means, the span covers all of R2. So there's no point I can't hit on this span right here. So I can say this span equals R2. Now let's try to prove this with algebra, linear algebra specifically. So I'm going to write the definition of the span first. So it's going to look like alpha 1 alpha 1 times vector 1 2 plus alpha 2 vector 2 1 such that alpha 1 alpha 2 are in R. Now to do something a little bit tricky, I have to show that any vector we can write in R2, I can pick an alpha of 1 and an alpha 2, and this linear combination will equal that vector. So take any vector V in R2, Show that V can be written as some alpha 1 times 1, 2 plus some alpha 2 times 2, 1. So if I take any vector in R2, there's really only one property that vector has to have. What is that property? What can you say about two dimensional vector? If I go to write it out. <coughs> What will it look like? Two numbers. But I can't say anything about the numbers. I can't say the first one's even and the second one is irrational. That's not representing every vector. I have to say that it can be two numbers, any two numbers. So I'm going to let A and B and R be any real number. So I'm just going to go with A and B. So let's write in a matrix. Before I do that, I'll write it in the standard order. My linear combination on the left and my constants on the right. Now I'm going to put this into a matrix. 1, 2, 2, 1, A, B. Now 
I did say A and B are any real numbers, but once we let A and B be any real numbers, what we're going to do after that is figure out which alpha 1 and alpha 2 <coughs> uh, would we use to get those two numbers. So they can be any real numbers, but once we set them here, we're not going to change them down below. So they're treated as constants. So pick any A and B you want, and what we're going to do is figure out alpha 1 and alpha 2 to get to those two numbers. So do some row reduction. The first step is definitely minus 2 row 1. Be careful with your constants because you're going to have A's and B's stacking up inside your constants. So it'll be, I think, A minus 2B will be your first constant there. So keep track of those. And then you probably can finish this off in one more row operation or maybe two more row operations. So reduce this matrix down. So any row operation questions? So I drew my uh, vertical bar to separate my constants because basically that column was getting crazy. So I didn't want some of that column to look like it was part of column two. So column three, I just wanted to keep it partitioned off by itself. You could do this anytime that your column gets crazy. I could partition column one if I want to make sure um, especially if I ha start having um, constants creeping in here, like A's, B's, things like that, and things start to be sums and differences, then you want to make sure things are separate. All right, so this is our algebraic answer, meaning if you pick A and B, here's the alpha 1, alpha 2 that get there. So let's just pick a specific A and B and see if we can get there. So what? let's just pick, pick an A and a B. Let's do something that's not too crazy. Let's do multiples of three, or math will be more fun. Uh, let's do maybe nine, 21. Negative nine, positive 21. So I just randomly picked them. They are multiples of three, but you can pick any two numbers you want. So find alpha one and alpha two that give us that linear combination for these. So find alpha one and alpha two that will give us that combination. You have the formula to figure out alpha one and alpha two from A and B. So get the alpha 1, alpha 2 right now.
I got alpha 1 is 17, alpha 2 is negative 13. So now we're going to try it out and see if it actually works. So I just rewrote our linear combination from above. So alpha 1 hopefully is 17 plus negative 13 times 2, 1. That's 17, 34 plus 20, negative 26, negative 13. Well, I'm bad at subtraction. Negative, hopefully it's negative 9. 34 minus 13 is 20, 21. Alright, so this combination got us that negative 9, 21. So you can pick any two values A and B you want and get alpha 1 and alpha 2 right away with this relationship right here. So what we just showed, you can take any two-dimensional vector you want and we can write down the combination to get there. So there is no vector in two dimensions that I can't get with the span. So that means the span covers all of R2. So we just proved it right here. so it has to equal R2. Alright, any questions on this problem? What two vectors, what two types of vectors would not span R2? There's infinite correct answers, but think about two vectors I could put in here, not 1, 2, and 2, 1, but two vectors I could use that would definitely not span R2. Same vectors. So what would I get if they were the same vectors? I would just get a line. What if they were both the zero vector? That'd be even less good. I would get just the origin. So that would be definitely not be R2. Uh, also, any two vectors that were parallel, I'd have the same problem. They don't have to be exact same, but if they point in the same direction. Even if they point backwards, I still have the exact same issue. I only get a line. So these are more geometrical properties that we'll look at. Uh, things get a little more crazy in three dimensions because you can have two vectors that are not parallel and then a third vector that's not parallel to either one but it still lives on the same plane those two generate. So things get more complicated in three dimensions. Two dimensions things are a lot nicer. But two dimensions are very well understood. So it's good for learning, not great for solving real problems. <laughs>